Chapter 18. Kiana Rubini. Top four reasons why my half-brother Chauncey is like Vladimir. One, the smell. Dirty diapers and baby puke. Enough said. Vladimir's terranium after the weekend is no perfume factory either. Two, the noise. Chauncey's howling has an edge in volume, but Vladimir's high-pitched squeaks are even more piercing. It goes without saying that both of them are spoiled by too much attention. That's Step Monster's fault in Chauncey's case. For Vladimir, it's Miss Fountain's seventh graders, and lately, us. When he wants someone to feed him a dead cricket, which is all the time, the cheeping and chirping are at a frequency that feels like a miniature blender at the center of your brain. Three, the teeth. They both have zero. Okay, Vladimir probably has more than that, but you don't know because they're... You don't know they're there until he nips you. And to be fair, Chauncey doesn't doesn't have a couple of chompers. Oh no, Chauncey does have a couple of chompers breaking through bottom front. It's pretty cute, actually. Four, the time suck. That's the biggest similarity between them. Dealing with Chauncey is a 25-hour per day job, mostly for Step Monster, but also for Dad and me. If you leave him alone for 10 seconds, he'll find a way to stick his drool-covered finger into electric outlet, light himself on fire, and roll down at least one flight of stairs. Vladimir is every bit as impossible to ignore. When he starts squeaking, you go running. And he's not satisfied with just anybody. These days, the attention he craves is from Aldo. Leave it to Vladimir to love the least lovable person in the whole school. Except maybe Elaine. Maybe it's the red hair. It's hard to ignore. Anyway, I really shouldn't complain that Step Monster is so distracted. If it wasn't for Chauncey, she might call up the school and ask how I'm doing and get told, Kiana who? The last thing I need is to be put in a regular cl- regular classes, and I just might and have to break to break in eight new teachers, just when I'm starting to get the hang of Mr. Kermit. Now that Ribbit's doing real teaching, I don't have to even make up things when Dad and Mo- Step Monster ask how school. I have something to tell them. There are things going on in room one one seven, things beyond worksheets and crossword puzzles. Hang on a sec, back up. My father stops me at dinner. What are, what are these puffy tails you keep talking about? Seems some kind of science unit? Right, I stammer. Animal autonomy. If you're going to be dis- dissecting some little poor bunny, I don't want to hear about it, Step Monster puts in, shoveling strained bananas into Chauncey's waiting mouth. And we're going on a field trip tomorrow, remember? I move on quickly. To a rabbit laboratory? Dad asks. No, this is different. We're going to Terranova Motors as Jake Terranova's personal guests. I don't know what we're supposed to learn there, but the class is actually pretty psyched about it. One of the downsides of being in SCS 8, besides the obvious, is that you're stuck in the same room all day, so the change of scenery will do us good. Our two chaperones are Mr. Kermit and Miss Fountain. Mr. Kermit has no choice, but it's really nice of Miss Fountain to volunteer since her own class have to have a sub today. As it turns out, they get Mrs. Landsman, a.k.a. Dawn of the Dead. Poor Vladimir. If he squeaks too loud, she'll probably gut him with a protractor and barbecue him on a rotating spit in the home and careers room. The bus is just a minibus, and it's pretty uncomfortable, with the whole class packed onto the sides and Elaine all by herself at the other. Aldo is getting mad because Barnstorm keeps thumping the back of his seat with one of his crutches. If it doesn't bother Raheem, it doesn't bother Raheem, though. He falls asleep as soon as we make the right turn out of the driveway. Mateo stands on the side of the aisle, Knees bent, working out his balance. Just like the silver surfer from Spider-Man, Miss Fountain seems pretty uncomfortable with the bad behavior, and especially the fact that Mr. Kermit isn't saying anything, so she tries to change the subject by talking about how SES 8 should participate in the district science fair. She's always coming up with suggestions for our class, like the good bunnies things, or inviting us for circle time, or to help out with Vladimir. Sometimes Mr. Kermit lets her push... Let's her push him around a little but not today no he simply he says simply i think this field trip has put a bad put him in a bad mood it's pretty obvious that jake terranova isn't his favorite person but it's a fantastic competition miss fountain persists teams enter from every school in the district there are prizes in the first place winners get an extra 10 percent added to their grades on the state state science assessment it's a win-win Not for us, Mr. Kermit replies firmly. 
His expression says it all. Do these really look like the kind of kids who will come first place at anything? It bugs me a little. Not that I'm dying to get mixed up in any science fair, me being a short timer, but I'm used to Mr. Kermit sticking up for us, not writing us off. Maybe it's part of his bad mood. The other kids talk about Jake Terranova like he's some kind of superstar. As we pull up to Terranova Motors, I finally understand why. It has to be the biggest car dealership I've ever seen, and that includes LA, where everything is supersized. Mr. Kermit's ex-student owns all this? That's pretty cool. Especially when Mr. Terranova himself comes out to welcome us. Hey guys, glad you could make it. Come on inside. Like we're longtime friends, not random middle schoolers getting our moment with the big boss. We tour the showroom first, which I have to admit is pretty fun. All the vehicles are shiny, new, and top of the line. We try out every seat in every car, front, back, third row, and even climb into the cargo beds of the pickups. For the first time since blundering into SES 8, I feel like I could be with, with any class of my kids in the country, not Greenwich Middle School's dreaded unteachables. Ribbit sees it too. His bloodshot eyes are half open instead of the usual 25%. Or maybe he's just on alert because Mr. Terranova is here, and this is enemy territory. Miss Fountain, the Prius driver, is looking disapprovingly at the giant SUVs and light trucks that dominate the showroom. When Mr. Terranova walks up to her, I'm wondering if she's going to lecture him on the environment. Instead, she says, this is a wonderful thing you're doing. I don't know if you can tell, but some of these kids have special issues. You think? His grin is irresistible. My floor manager just pulled a sleeper out of the trunk of the Cadillac. That's Raheem, Miss Fountain explains. He doesn't get enough sleep at home, but he's a talented artist, sensitive and observant. They've got their quirks, but they're good kids. Okay, maybe good is too strong a word. <coughs> gotcha. He's watching Barnstorm poking tires with his crutches. Hey, Mr. Terranova, Parker approaches. I want to take the red Mustang out for a test drive. Very, oh, right. Very funny, kid. No, really, I have a license. Parker digs his mangled ID out of the pocket of his jeans. It's a provisional license, Parker. Miss Fountain reminds him gently. This is 100% farm business, Parker promises. I remembered I've got a swing at home and a pickup, a pickup of a load of turnips for Safeway. Looking for a lifeline, she calls. Mr. Kermit, I think it's time for lunch. It's hard to get a handle on what Ribbit thinks of all this. On one hand, it's obvious that he can't stand former students, his former student because of what happened in the past. On the other hand, that must have been forever ago. Mr. Terranova was a seventh grader, even younger than we are. He's an adult now, running a big business, and he's trying to make amends. Why can't Kermit see that? We brought bag lunches, but Terranova ordered pizzas for everybody in the dealership dining room. Only Ribbit turns him down like anything from his old nemesis would turn into poison as soon as it enters his mouth. The employees are really friendly, and we get to ask them questions. I want to know about the fuel efficiency standards. Barnstorm wants to know, when you sell a car, do you get to keep the money? Aldo asked the lease specialist, how long did it take to grow that mustache? Elaine gets in a cup into the cookie platter set aside for customer appreciation week. After lunch, we tour the service department. That's where the field trip starts to get really good. Motor vehicles are such a huge part of life, especially in a place like LA, where you have to drive pretty much everywhere. Well, that's my kids running crazy. Yay for self-isolation. <laughs> People take it for granted that their cars will work, like they're powered on some kind of magic. How often do we ever take a peek under the hood at the machinery that makes it happen? Mr. Terranova leads us to a raised catwalk, and we can look down on at least a dozen vehicles on lifts of various stages of being taken apart and put back together again. The noise is a cacophony of revving engines, pneumatic tools, and the clang of metal on metal. The smell is a mix of oil and grease with a little bit of exhaust. Whatever the ventilation fans miss. Yeah, there's almost a kind of grace to it. A rhythm that's hard to resist. It feels productive. Like necessary work is being done. Parker is practically drooling. And even Aldo is leaning over the railing, fascinated. The first time I... 
It's the first time I've seen him interested in something, and he looks older and more mature. Mateo was babbling about how the shop reminds him of the engine room in the USS Enterprise on Star Trek. Star Trek. Rahim is sketching furiously on a napkin from the lunchroom, and Elaine is watching in rapt attention, while double-fisting stolen cookies from her jacket pockets. Suddenly, she clutches the rail in distress. For a second, I wonder if she's trying to hype her reputation by ripping it free from the catwalk. But no, her cheeks are pink and her eyes are terrified. Sharp, staccato, choking sounds reach over the clamor of the shop. Mr. Kermit pounds on her back to no avail. I run up behind Elaine and I reach around her to perform the Heimlich maneuver, maneuver, positioning my hands below the ribcage like they told us in life-saving class back in California. Once, twice, no good. Three times, heads up, bellows a wild voice. I glance over my shoulder just in time to see a crutch hurling toward me in a home run swing. I drop to the metal floor of the catwalk a split second before the wooden shaft would have taken my head off. It slams across Elaine's back, broad back, and with a thud that momentarily drowns out the noisy shop, splits in two. Everyone waits for her to crumble to the catwalk, unconscious, but that's not what happens. Elaine doesn't even flinch. Instead, a chunk of cookie comes flying out of her mouth. It sails over the rail and drops into the half-dissembled motor of a vintage Corvette. The mechanic looks up in horror. What was that? Mr. Terranova asks urgently. I confirm that Elaine is no longer choking. She's okay. The car dealer looks at me like I'm totally missing the point. But what did she spit into the engine? Elaine smacks her lips. I think it was a ginger snap. The word is like panic alarm to Jake. Guys, he calls down to his team. I want that engine taken apart. Every piece wiped clean. Now. I'm mystified. What's so bad about a ginger snap? Sugar, he exclaims in agony. It's the last thing that you want in a car engine. It dissolves in the gas and will end up everywhere. If word gets out that I sold a car with a sugar tank, I'm finished. Mr. Kermit is beaming from ear to ear. It's the first time we've ever seen him happy. And what did it take? Problems for Jake Terranova. I actually feel a little guilty. I saw Elaine pocket those cookies and I kept my mouth shut. I might be a short timer, but you don't have to be at school very long to know that Elaine rhymes with pain. The field trip breaks up soon after that. Mr. Terranova is focused on the Corvette, so he's not playing host anymore. Plus, Barnstorm is complaining about his mobility with only one crutch. Then you shouldn't have busted it on Elaine over Then you shouldn't have busted the other one over Elaine's head, Aldo tells him. It was her back, not her head, Barnstorm retorts. I saved her life, man. She better remember that while deciding who's going to be her ne- who her next victim is going to be. You just cost yourself a puffy tail, Buster. Mister Kermit snaps. Barnstorm is bitter. No fair! I saved a life, and I'm out of crutch and a puffy tail. What kind of justice is that? He should earn a puffy tail for helping, and lose it for being mean. Parker puts in. At least then he breaks even. We should all get a puffy tail, except Elaine, although reasons reluctantly. You know. For not barfing a cookie into a Corvette? That seems to be his idea of fairness. Elaine tosses a mild glance in Aldo's direction and he decides to stand on the other side of the tall cargo van. It's too bad that such a great field trip has to end on a down note. But by the time, by then, the minibus is waiting for us outside. So there's nothing to do but get over it. Halfway back to school, Miss Fountain gets a call on her cell phone. It's the dealership. There's a middle school boy asleep on the couch in the showroom. Mr. Kermit does a head count. It's Raheem, he reports. We have to go back and get him. And we turn around. Wait, I frown at Miss Fountain. How come they called you? I mean, why does Jake Terranova have your cell phone number? She blushes the color of Chauncey's diaper rash. Uh Uh-oh. Why do you think that Miss Fountain has given her phone number to Mr. Terranova? Question mark. Alrighty, we'll have to find out in the next chapter. Sorry about all the noise of my kids, but that's how it is in real life when you're working at home with kids in the house.